about some of our work on um, machine learning infrastructure at Stripe, and specifically in service of like future engineering and being able to write your business logic into your future in one place, have it run everywhere, and also eliminate some kind of common causes of errors, class of errors that can come up and like kind of destroy your model performance. Um, so first I'll tell you a little bit about machine learning at Stripe, like what we do and what some of our machine learning problems are, talk about like what are some of these thorny problems in developing features that we run into and our approach to solving them and then just kind of like what's actually running in production. So if you're not familiar with Stripe, um, Stripe is a toolkit for starting and running an internet business. If you want to have a business, especially an online business, you usually need to like have a way for people to pay you so you can like make money. Um, and so a big part of what we do is provide uh, infrastructure for payments and processing like billions of dollars a year with probably lots of businesses that you've heard of or maybe you even work at. Uh, so because our users are businesses and they're kind of online businesses and always uh, sending us transactional data, we're growing, they're growing. Machine learning is like a pretty good tool to kind of help us make decisions at scale, whether it's in our charge flow or about our accounts. One of the things that's kind of unique about us is that our machine learning is also kind of like high stakes. Um, like it's not that a widget won't look right or like you know maybe you get shown a wrong ad. It's like you could like shut down you know a really big user by mistake if we're wrong in our machine learning or like we could let a lot of bad transactions through and that could hit bottom line of our users. So it's really important that what we do is reproducible and that um, what we think will happen from training a model is actually what happens in production, especially if you think about something like potentially letting fraudulent payments through, like you might not find out about that for a while. Uh, so um, here are a few examples of where we use machine learning, both in our user business product as well as internally. Radar is our fraud product. This page is actually, as of today, out of date. We did a big new release that will use some of the stuff I'll talk about. Um, but basically, for every transaction in real time, um, we evaluate whether or not we think the payment is good or bad, and we'll like block it or give users tools to decide what to do if we think it might not be good. This is kind of an example of like what it looks like if we block a payment as fraudulent, and here you're already starting to see like here's a feature, right? As we try and tell a user why did we block the payment, so we'll kind of talk about like where these features come from. Um, we won't talk about it. Kind of like a separate talk for how do we choose what to show here, but. Um, if you're interested in that, ask me at office hours. Uh, another place we use machine learning is uh, in our billing subscription product. Like if you have a subscription every month that you're charging someone as a business, if one of the charges fails, you want to be able to retry. So we use machine learning to figure out like what is the optimal time to retry in order to maximize the revenue. Um, um, and then we also use machine learning a lot like internally as well to optimize our operations. So an example that's shown here is um, to kind of like help suggest resolution paths for some customer support uh, customer support requests. And we have like kind of a tight loop of agents helping train and like um, using the models and kind of like interacting with them. We also do a lot of machine learning for understanding like who our users are and whether there's something like you know, whether there's a bad actor or someone selling something they're not supposed to or something like that. Um, so across all these applications, these are pretty much all cases where you're trying to do prediction or classification. Um, and you're gonna want some set of features to help you do that. And then some, a lot of these applications are also kind of like very real time driven, particularly our fraud product radar. Like, you know, in the time it takes to have your online credit card accepted, we not only need to do the full fraud evaluation, we also need to do things like send it to the card networks. And there's not actually like a lot of time to do all that computation. That will factor in a little bit to what I talked about. Okay, so now you know I kind of told you like why, what are the applications, and where are we using modeling? But like, how do we build a model, right? Um, so if you take you know Coursera, Andrew's class on machine learning or something, um, they'll probably give you something like this, right? So each each row is um, some event, and then you have a bunch of features. They have some value. 
and then um, have some some beautiful label that has kind of like you just like know what the ground truth is. Um, and so this is kind of like the fiction about machine learning that like someone just like bestows upon you this beautiful <laughs> matrix of data that all you need to do is train a model on it. It'll it'll look the same in training and production, and like it'll just be like really easy to create this, right? Uh, but I think a lot of times, and you know, it's already come up here yesterday and today, like kind of creating the features and like being able to get to this point is actually the hard part. Like this part where you take this matrix and you like have a function that produces a model. That's not always so hard. Like whether it doesn't matter if it's like a deep learning model or like gradient boosted decision trees or a linear model. Um, that's often like not actually kind of the hard part of your production machine learning. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about that at all. Um, and just to kind of like give you an example here um, for the case of radar where we're trying to classify transactions as good or bad if you had like a decision tree model, right? This is sort of like a visualization of what it would look like. Um, so you'd like to have this like nice tall skinny matrix that you can like um, compute all your features from but you know, the reality, especially when you're working with real-time systems, is a little bit more like this. Um, there's some data being shoved at you from a bunch of different places, like maybe you have some databases, maybe you have some Kafka queues, maybe you reach out to some external services, like you want to do GUIP lookups, or you, you know, want to somehow like enrich your internal data with something outside of your organization. And it's just kind of like all shoved at you, and then you have to figure out what to do to kind of like put it into this like normal scene matrix that then you can use to train your algorithm. Um, and again, kind of like here's an example to sort of think through like what are the features from the case of our fraud product radar. Um, so there's kind of three columns here, the amount of the charge, the country associated with the credit card, um, the number of countries that card was used from, say in the past day. So like, you know, if my credit card was used yesterday in Africa and in Europe and in South America, like that's probably a pretty good indication that the next transaction is fraudulent. Um, so then you can kind of think about like where do these features come from? Like amount in USD, that's probably something you can just like kind of pull directly off the charge, whether it's an event or in your database. Country of the card, like maybe that's in the same place. Maybe you saved it somewhere when you created the card. Um, and then it starts getting really complicated when you think about and this is even just like a pretty simple case, like how many countries was this card used from in the past hour? Like how are you gonna compute that and how are you gonna make sure it's the same thing in real time in production and on the training side? Um, so basically like sort of as we looked over all of these different machine learning problems, like um, you know, the transaction fraud case, understanding our users, like looking at customer support or um, the optimal timing for subscription recharges, we noticed that there were a bunch of problems that they all had in common in figuring out like what features to build the model with and how to calculate them. So one is that, like I mentioned, you know, this data kind of like comes at you from all these different directions. Um, so you have a bunch of different data stores, a bunch of different event streams, like how do you fit them all together? Um, another problem is that you always, you know, you always want to train your model on like the state of the world at the time when the prediction would have been made. Um, and so it gets like kind of complicated to start getting that right when your features get more complicated. Like even for the case where it's how many, um, say how many distinct card countries was, this car countries was this card used from in the past day? Like it's a little bit of work to start kind of keeping track of that. And if you add another layer or two on top of that, it gets like really mind bending and easy to mess up. Sort of similarly to that, um, a pretty common mistake in feature engineering is having like kind of this label leakage, which I'll give you an example of, but um, basically where you like use future data that you didn't have at the time and sort of build that into your model. So I'll show you another example, but like, you know, one case could be if you are recording some records, like when you make a sales deal or something, and when you know it's gonna close, you just like don't fill in some fields. So then not filling in fields looks like an awesome predictor of like closing a deal, but actually that's like not meaningful at all, right? and you're gonna get some weird results if that's what your model predicts. Um, so those are all kind of on the, especially those middle two are sort of like correctness issues. I think another couple of issues people often run into that we saw are like, how do you make sure just that things are the same? Um, 
like your stack for training your models, you may be writing like a Spark job or some batch job. Um, but maybe in production, like your application runs in Ruby, so you're gonna like go rewrite all your features in Ruby, right? So like, especially for kind of edge cases, how are you gonna make sure that that code is like actually producing the same result? So basically, these are these are the problems that we were trying to like aim to solve, um, and basically like especially focusing on sort of like eliminating these classes of errors around time aware joins and label leakage by not letting people make those mistakes, just kind of like taking it out of the realm of possibility. Um, and here is kind of like another example of this problem of label leakage or training on future data. Like let's say. I'm a future engineer and I'm like trying to figure out, I have like a great idea that, um, you know, probably I should look at the fraud rate um, for the email of the user. That seems like something that might be predictive of fraud. So I'm, you know, in this case, I'm the example user and I made a couple of charges on a couple of different businesses. Um, and then after the fact, like, you know, I guess I was using my pile of stolen credit cards. So both of those were disputed by the actual card holder. Um, so then, you know, the problem here would be if you calculate the fraud rate at the end of this sequence of events, you're like, wow, like kellyattrape.com, 100% fraud, awesome. And then if you pull that back into your model, that's gonna cause problems because of the time of the charges. You didn't actually know that that was the case. You didn't have that data. Um, and I'll just point out that, like, in this case, we're mostly talking about features for kind of like fancy machine learning models. But um, rules are actually models too. So even if you're just thinking about writing rules, you kind of like need to consider this as well. So this is a picture of, um, from our radar product where we let people kind of also write blocker or allow rules and we try and give them some statistics about like what would have happened if they applied this in the past so that they don't like accidentally block all their payments. Um, so here it's also important that you get sort of like a realistic snapshot of what your features were at a given point in time. So basically when we kind of like step back and thought about like how can we sort of eliminate these types of um, cases of things like label leakage or like messing up a type aware join and how can we also kind of provide like a really rich um, set of features that users are able to build without having to think a lot about the implementation. We kind of came to this model of features and events. There's kind of two core concepts and everything is sort of designed around this. So basically, um, you know, events are like things that come out of a Kafka queue. Um, they're just like things that happen at particular times. And then a feature is more of like a continuously valued thing. But the key thing in this model is that like the only thing that can change the value of a feature is an event. So it's kind of like a closed system. Um, I guess if you are like a physicist like me, maybe you think about it that way. Um, and so basically like, you know, all we need to do are sort of figure out like what operations you can take on features and events and then we're gonna make our system kind of take care of like figuring out how to do the lookups in time like automatically. Um, so yeah, basically the input matrix to your model is just like a feature that's attached to an event. So for any event you can do you can sort of like look up like what was the value of the feature at the time of an event. Um, so if I wanna know like, you know, I have some charge event and I wanna know how many, how many countries was this card used from at that time, I can just kind of like do that look up. Um, and then basically this is kind of all we need to either do like model training or to do evaluation like real time serving. Um, one thing that's important for this is that we need all of the data inputs and like we assume that they are immutable evented data um, and this makes this picture like basically work. So it's not very important to read all the code but um, this is kind of like a very basic sketch of what these two core types are, um, events and features. So you know, for events you have, it's actually more like a stream of events and then there are individual instances. And these are things that pop out of Kafka and they're associated with a particular timestamp. Um, and a feature on the other hand, a feature is like about a thing. So, you know, it could be, um, what's the country of this associated with this credit card is like a feature about a card. 
or like how old am I is like about me. Like it's not about Dan. It doesn't make sense. Um, so any feature always has the subject of type K here. Um, and then one nice thing is that that kind of lets us like partition updates to the feature by different Ks. And so, you know, K could be your user. It could be like some ID. It could be anything. But a feature is kind of like always about a thing. Um, and then we kind of give our users, our machine learning engineers, an API to kind of like, um, you know, define operations. So like for an event, you can, you can filter an event. Like for Stripe, we have live mode API, we have a test mode API. The test mode API is just for testing. So we like throw all that data out like every time we want to train a model about what happens in the actual world. Um, or like we can have a map, like if we only want to take like um, some, some, we want to kind of like take some function, like take the first letter of the name coming out. Um, and similarly, we have kind of operations we can do on feature. So like a feature.map basically just like takes some, some of the columns and applies some operation and then you get like a new column. So in the example mentioned here, let's say that we have a business and we have their total charge count and their total charge amount. Um, we can just like use a map to write the average amount. And so some of the things you've probably noticed here, um, there's nothing about time, there's nothing about implementation, all you have to do is write like the business logic of your feature. That's kind of the goal. Um, and then like where it gets really cool and interesting is that you can do, you can kind of like go between features and events and come up with some pretty complicated stuff. So like an event.lookup will read a feature. Um, so you know, when you're generating the training data, you always want the events to see the value of the feature at the time, as it was like at the time of the event. So basically like we give our machine learning engineers sort of like a really nice primitive to do this. So the event is kind of, you're just kind of like sampling the feature at different points in time when you do this lookup. Um, and then you can kind of like join these things together to create some pretty complex features. Um, we also you know, provide something like a feature.latest where you can say like just you know, tell me the the latest value of the feature as it is now, um, which may or may not be defined, like if nothing's happened already. Um, and so like, you know, our machine learning engineers can take a bunch of different events and they can say, like, take this feature here and then do this lookup into this other event and combine it here and map it over there. And they can write like these really complex features over a large number of events using just this really simple API where they can't get anything wrong with respect to thinking about the time. Um, and this is what we call kind of like temporal consistency, that the system kind of manages all of this for you. So these are some kind of like silly, trivial example features um, that are actually basically like unit tests in our code. Um, so in this case, you know, a, someone who really likes dogs was the creator of this code. So we have some event streams that are like barks by the dog, jumps by the dog, howls by the dog. And then it's really easy to do things like write a feature for um, has a dog of a particular name barked, or like you know what's what's the average volume associated with some dog when you look at their stream of barks and their stream of howls. So these are kind of silly examples, but um, you know if you think back to kind of some of our other examples, like if you're trying to identify like a bad actor in our system. Um, some of the more complicated types of things we could do are like, you know, we could look at um, features like what's the fraud rate for that user's email domain or like aggregating across all of their transactions, looking at the distinct email domain names, what's the average fraud rate across all of those for the user? Um, and those things would be like really hard to define if you had to actually kind of go write the feature code in the time and figure out like what were these things at the time of the transaction but they're really easy to write in a small, small number of lines of code in this framework. Um, so probably like one thing you might be wondering, it looks like it's really easy to write these complicated features, but like how do you actually run this thing, right? Like somewhere you have to kind of like go connect to all of your data stores or your production systems. Um, so basically what we do here is like 
we have sort of like an, a syntax tree from what our users have written. And then we can kind of like almost write compilers for, for any given backend we want to run it on um, to be able to like evaluate that. Um, so we can do this in different contexts. Like we can do it if we want to create the training set by looking across the total history and kind of like computing the features at every single point in time. Um, or we can do it at the current time um, given the event sources. So we have a few different backends, like an interpreter, a MapReduce-like backend that we use. You know, you can run with like Scalding or Spark to produce your training data. And then we also have a um, push-based real-time backend where you know you sort of like take a single event and like do kind of a scatter gather across all of these different operations and lookups and like you know go write something to a store here and look it up there um, and then like write out the result so all of these the important thing is that our machine learning engineers don't have to think about any of them they just write their future code it's really simple and then uh, the machine learning infrastructure team gets to do the fun part of like figuring out how to actually run all these things. But one of the nice things here is that because this is all hidden from the user, like you know, if Stripe decides to migrate any of our technologies here, or if we're just like interested in trying something else out, our users don't even have to know about it. Um, our internal users here, it's like something that we can do as a systems team, and it's like totally opaque to them. So it gives us a lot of flexibility to do things like performance optimizations or um, just to like be working with different technologies or um, whatever the different needs are for like where we need to be running and evaluating our features. Um, so this code is not, not gonna talk through this, but basically the point is that we do actually do this and it does actually run. This is um, an example from our MapReduce-like backend that we kind of like compile this intermediate representation that we can run in batch jobs. Um, we have kind of one of these for each context that we want to run in, whether it's a batch job or whether it's this push-based real-time system. Uh, so then you might wonder, you know, do you actually use this in production? Yes, we absolutely use this in production. It's being used in uh, our new launch of the Radar product to generate really a pretty amazing set of uh, pretty complicated and highly predictive features. So, and um, you know, I mentioned that it's sort of easy, like our users have sort of surprised us with their creativity. They have written some pretty amazing sets of features. The most complicated uh, kind of feature graphs that we've seen have around 1,400 feature and event nodes. Um, and kind of on the real-time side in our push-based system, we're able to update features for pretty complex feature graphs um, in around P99 of 60 milliseconds, which on the one hand is not like super fast, like this is um, you know, a fair amount slower than a lot of our model evaluation, but um, these are pretty large graphs and this can involve like writing to a, writing or reading from a bunch of different stores and updating a lot of keys. So I think when you think about it in that context, um, it actually is pretty performant and something like 60 milliseconds, like you know, if you're thinking about trying to prevent fraud in a transaction, like it takes you like a couple of seconds actually, usually to make an online transaction. You have to do things like reach out to banks. Um, those things take a little bit of time. So kind of in that context, I think 60 milliseconds is like not a bad price to pay in order to like have really predictive features that stop fraud from going through to your business. Uh, and then in terms of how this all fits together, it's a little bit complicated. Um, this, is, this is actually not the transaction fraud case for radar. It's a slightly different application. But basically, we kind of start with uh, what we call physical events, which are things that pop out of Kafka queues. We turn them into more like kind of like logical events through this features framework. Um, we, and then through whatever compiler we're running, whether it's the push-based real-time system or the batch system, we create some kind of like feature job. Um, and then we pass that to our model scoring system, which we call Diorama, because dioramas are for models and we love puns. Um, and then here you can see also the sort of like push-based real-time system that we call Peddler, which writes out to these different stores and is kind of a Lambda system. Um, and you know, also write some events that we archive. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like 
for uh, the real-time system and how we run it. And you know, when we tell people about some of the features that we've been writing, like a common question we get is like, oh, are you going to open source this? Uh, and I think the answer is maybe. Like, you know, it's hard to figure out like which pieces here do you pull out? Because I, I think one of the things that's interesting about machine learning infrastructure is that it's almost like by definition built on top of all of your company's other infrastructure. Um, and so it's like a little bit less shareable than some libraries that um, are you know, really great for open source. But we're thinking about it. Let us know if you're interested. Um, so just to kind of like come back a little bit and uh, summarize what I've talked about, um, I told you about a system that gives a like sort of restricted but very powerful API for feature engineers where you can construct really complex features joining together over a bunch of different types of events, but you don't have to think at all about like how those features are going to run from an implementation point of view, and you also don't have to think about this like element of time. You can kind of prevent mistakes in time where it joins and prevent mistakes with label leakage that can lead to like really, really bad outcomes in your modeling performance. Uh, the sort of nature of having these different backend systems means that um, as an infrastructure team, we have a lot of ability to optimize or run in different environments. Like it's easy to change sort of how we compute without changing like the logical meaning of the feature or sort of like what you're computing. Um, and we've basically been able to completely separate the problem of like writing business logic from um, implementation details, and that's let our machine learning engineers just like, you know, they had some, before we started this, I think they had some backlog of maybe like hundreds of features that they wanted to try implementing, and it was like this painful process where every, every week or every month, like maybe you get through one of them, maybe you put it in production, maybe there aren't any bugs, and they just kind of like cleared all of them out. Um, it actually surprised us a little bit. Um, and so, you know, finally, you sort of free the feature engineer from having to worry about temporal consistency. And then some of, some of these features that sound really complicated, like, actually get pretty easy to write, which is really cool. Um, and then, like everyone else, Stripe is hiring. We have a lot of interesting roles for data and machine learning. We're actually hiring an engineering manager for our machine learning infrastructure team. So you could be the person managing this really cool work. Um, <laughs> We, as I mentioned, you know, we use all of the data technology. A lot of our applications are around tracking and moving money. So, you know, it's very high stakes. You know it's important to the company. You know it's important to your users. Um, that's pretty cool to work on. And uh, hopefully I've given you a little bit of a picture of some of the state of the art infrastructure we've built for future engineering. We've also done a lot of work that I haven't talked about, um, but would be happy to answer any questions about for like model training and um, both offline evaluation and online evaluation. Um, so thanks for listening. Happy to answer any questions. And um, extra thank yous to the four folks here who basically did all the technical work that I talked about, um, which I took credit for as a manager. So thanks. <laughs> All right, we've got some time for questions. Uh, if you've got a question, please just raise your hand. Hi, Kelly. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I was kind of curious whether you could speak to feature reuse between machine learning engineers. Yes, that is an awesome question. Um, so the question is sort of like, you know, you have these different applications, like can you reuse features between them? And that was actually, I guess I didn't talk about it, but that was like a goal that we kind of wanted to come to as well to make it really easy to have this features catalog, basically. Um, and we've actually already, even in kind of like the first few users, people have like been able to sort of wholesale reuse large sets of features and spin up new applications really quickly. The one thing you have to be careful about is the versioning for that, um, because you don't want one person to break another. So all of these things are, um, feature sets are versioned, and then we have some kind of tooling to like freeze versions that makes it harder to like inadvertently clobber something running in production or clobber somebody else's thing. But yeah, that's a great question. So is that um, uh, like in a central library or a repository, or is that like how, how it comes? Yeah, this is just in code in like one repo, but um, 
you know, people organize their files pretty well. So they're like, you know, here's the file for like the the card counters, or like here's the file for the behavioral features. So it's pretty easy for people to tell what's what's in it and be able to reuse. Do you persist the results of those transformations anywhere, or are people expecting that they need to rerun whatever system? Yeah. Some system of them? Yeah. So whether whether we persist the results is a great question. Um, it probably depends a little bit in which context we're running them in. So like um, in real time. Like basically any time we score any model, we definitely log what all the features are in addition to kind of updating the scores, stores. Um, on the batch side, like sort of the batch process produces some output. I think kind of what you're getting at maybe is um, about having to recompute a lot. So one of the things that was another kind of important idea that we wanted going in was to design features these kind of complex sets of features so that you can still break them apart like internally. And that should enable us to do some kind of like smart feature caching where we can store things like, you know, maybe over some some time bucket and then like if nothing's changed and the feature hasn't changed, then you don't have to recompute it. And that's actually pretty important. Like, you know, if you're if you're training something like fraud models. Uh, you generally want to run it over some decent amount of time, like the scale of transactions is not web scale, and just like the time periods associated with things are a little bit longer, like it takes you some time to get the label, was this disputed? Or if you're writing a model for credit risk, like sort of the span over which credit risky things happen is just like a little bit longer. So people actually are like pretty interested <laughs> in being able to recompute over all of Stripe's data, so I think that like being set up to eventually be able to kind of have better caching of features will be really, really useful for the development cycle. Um, as far as the fraud detection that you guys do, is there a lot of overlap between what you guys do and what your credit card companies do, or are you, are you incentivized to do things ahead of time? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the credit card companies definitely do, you know, some of their own evaluation. If you've ever like, you know, traveled to another state and tried to buy gas and then like not had the transaction go through, it definitely has happened to me. Um, they don't tell us what their models are, although they do give us like, you know, we work with them and they give us things like files about whether the charge was disputed. There's definitely a lot of things that they miss um, and that we want to be able to provide for our users. And like in some cases, we have more information than they do, right? Um, like, you know, we have all the information we can capture from the payment page, like some things like potentially behavioral features or like GOIP features, and they just like have no way of knowing that. Um, so that's kind of why it's really important that users have good integrations with us so that we get as much information as possible. And then we can kind of, we also know like what's going on over the entire Stripe network, right? So the more users we have, the better our models are because we can see that you know, your card was just used like on this other business from a totally different location. So I think basically like everyone kind of runs their own models, but they have, they have different information. Um, Sort of related to that, you know, we've also kind of tried to model like what are the card networks models, which is like a declines model rather than a fraud model. Um, but that's a pretty interesting problem too. Yeah. Any question about um, temporal sort of resolution? So it's super cool if you're able to go back and add something together and like say it hits the temporally consistent. Um, I can imagine like one user who's maybe a fraudulent user, um, depending on like how often you sample it. At points in time, um, what the world looks like then, that gives you potentially like more rows in your yeah. meters. Um, and if you sample the user a lot, it might be sort of that overrepresented in any set of everything, like more rows. Yep. Um, how do you handle sort of like the right resolution at which you sample time? Yeah, so I mean, this is a great question. And I guess we're not actively sampling time. The question is, like, what events do we get? Um, but you know, we have, for example, events for every charge. So like our biggest users will have four events, right? So then we still have this problem of like your training set has like a whole lot of your top user. Um, 
So we've done a bunch of different things. Like we've tried kind of different ways to filter our prune. We also now, um, for our, a lot of our larger users, we actually develop like user specific models for them that are only trained on their data. And then we can kind of compare that against the global model and see like, is the performance better for them? And if it is, we'll give them like their own special model. Um, so I think that's definitely something we look at in terms of like what data goes into the model training, but also like how we break apart, like so we don't just have one model, but actually like, you know, hundreds of models.